In today's session, we're diving deep into droip symbols, what they are, how to build your first one, and the smart ways you can edit, reuse, and manage them like a pro. Whether you're just getting started or looking to streamline your workflow, this tutorial has you covered. Let's dive right in and get started. Here's how we'll walk through the concept of droip symbols in this session. First, we'll get familiar with what symbols are and how they can simplify your workflow. Next, we'll show you how to create your symbols from scratch. Then we'll explore how to use symbols effectively across your project. We'll also dive into customizing the design of a symbol to match your style needs. Plus, we'll cover how to change the content within a symbol. And finally, we'll bring it all together by showing you how to set up a global header and footer for your website using symbols. Think of Droip symbols as reusable components. You create a design once, apply all your creative flair, and then convert it into a symbol. From there, you can drop it into any page as many times as you want without starting from scratch each time. Now let's walk through how to create a symbol from scratch in Droip. We started with a basic web page layout built using sections from the wireframe library. As you can see, there are several buttons, CTAs, and other repeatable elements across the page. In this project, we have a CTA section that we want to include on every page. When we inspect its structure, we'll notice it uses a flex layout with padding, specific sizes, typography settings, and more. It's not overly complex, but it does have multiple nested layers with different styles. Rebuilding the same section across 20 pages? Definitely not ideal. Doing the same thing 20 times is a massive waste of time and energy. That's exactly where symbols come in to save the day. Just click on the CTA section, right click, and select Create Symbol from the menu. A pop-up will appear where you can name your symbol and assign it to a group. Let's name the symbol CTA and place it inside a new group called Components. And just like that, we've created our first symbol. Now to reuse it, head to the Insert panel and open the Symbols library. Under Components, you'll find the CTA symbol ready to use. And that's how easy it is to create a symbol from scratch. Now that we've created our symbols, where exactly should we use them? Let's say we have several pages. For now, we want to place our CTA on both the About page and the Portfolio page. So we'll simply go to the Pages panel and open the About page. Then, open the Symbols Library tab and drag the CTA symbol right below the section where you want it. And just like that, we've reused the CTA without having to rebuild it from scratch. Basically, any element you plan to reuse across your project can be turned into a symbol. Now there's another handy way to create symbols as well. For example, say we want to turn the client details from a testimonial card into a symbol. You could check the Layers panel, but it can often be cluttered with a long list of elements. Instead, we can simply select the element in the editor, say the client's name, and use the top right panel to inspect its hierarchy, from children to parent elements. Let's say we realize we don't want to symbolize the name alone, but the entire client info block instead. We might want to reuse that same block elsewhere in the project, like in a client list. And as soon as you select the client info block, you'll see it highlighted directly in the editor. So from the right-hand panel, you'll find the option to create symbol directly from the menu. Just like before, give it a name, assign it to a group, and hit create. Done. So feel free to explore as you work and build symbols in whichever way feels most intuitive to you. Up next, we'll take a look at how to edit both the styles and content of a symbol. Let's begin by dragging in a few instances of the CTA symbol we created earlier. Maybe three or four of them. So we can clearly observe how any style or content changes affect all of them together. Now, let's look at how to change the styles of symbols globally. The first method is by simply double-clicking on any symbol instance. This action takes you into the symbol editing mode, also known as the main mode. Once inside, your Layers panel will only display the layers that belong to that particular symbol. Let's try something simple, like changing the background color. Once you exit editing mode and return to the main editor, you'll notice that all instances of the CTA symbol have been updated automatically. The second method is through the symbols library. From there, locate your symbol, enter edit mode, 
apply the desired style changes, and return to your page. Just like before, the updates will apply to every instance of that symbol throughout your project. Pretty efficient, right? Now, here comes a crucial part. What if you want to make changes to just one instance of a symbol without affecting all the others? That's a pretty common use case. In such cases, you can simply select the specific symbol instance, right-click, and choose Detach from Symbol. Once detached, you're free to make any changes you like to that instance, and none of those changes will impact the original symbol or its other instances across your project. Now, so let's see if you change your mind or want to undo the detachment, you can always hit Reset All Overrides to bring it back to the original symbol state. Now, let's move on to how content changes work with symbols. When you double-click on a symbol and update the content of a specific element, for example, changing a text to click here, this change will only apply to this individual instance. It won't update across all instances globally. This gives you the flexibility to reuse the same symbol layout while customizing the content for different contexts or pages. However, if you want to change the text content globally, you'll need to go through the symbols library. From there, enter edit mode, make your updates to the text, and those changes will reflect across all symbol instances, except the ones where you've already manually edited the content by double-clicking. Those remain unchanged. So let's quickly recap what we've learned. To make global style changes to a symbol, you can either double-click the symbol to enter editing mode, or head over to the symbols library and make your changes from there. If you need to make individual style changes, simply detach the symbol from the original. This allows you to modify that specific instance without affecting others, and you can always reset overrides if needed. For individual content changes like updating text, just double click the symbol and make your edits. These won't affect other instances. But if you want to update text globally across all uses of that symbol, you'll need to go into the symbols library's edit mode and update the content there. Now at this stage, let's dive a bit deeper into some practical concepts. You might be thinking, why not just copy and paste a component wherever we need it instead of using symbols? Well, let's break down why that's not the best idea. First, when your project is loaded with layers upon layers, hunting down that one specific component becomes a nightmare. Sure, you might find it eventually, but will you really copy and paste it across multiple pages and sections again and again? Definitely not efficient. Secondly, if you accidentally tweak something in one of those pasted components without realizing it, that small mistake can ripple across your project, which is the last thing you want. With symbols, your component stays safe in a neat little bubble, and you only make changes when you intentionally mean to. Another great advantage, let's say you've built a complex component that you want to treat as a stable asset. You can save it as a symbol like your personal draft. Later, if you want to experiment, just drag it down and go wild with variations without touching the original. So in short, symbols don't just save time, they help you organize better, avoid mishaps, and experiment freely. The last thing we need to cover is how to make your header or nav bar and footer using symbols. Let's dive in. Now we already have a nav bar and a footer on our page. We'll start by selecting the navigation section, right clicking to create a symbol, naming it nav bar and placing it under a group called header. Done. Now from the layers panel, let's delete the symbol instance for the header. Don't worry, we'll bring it back shortly. Next, we'll do the same for the footer. Select it, right click, create a symbol, name it footer, group it under footer, and hit create. Once that's done, we'll remove the symbol from the layer as well. Now let's head over to the symbols library. From there, select the nav bar and choose set as header. Do the same for the footer by selecting set as footer. And just like that, your header and footer are placed properly on your web page. If we hadn't removed the symbol instances earlier, we'd have ended up with two headers and footers on the page. So this step helps avoid duplication. The best part? This method of setting a component as a header or footer applies the header and footer across all pages in your project. For example, your About and Portfolio pages now both have the same header and footer in place. But what if you've got a unique page, maybe a landing page, that doesn't follow the same design as this page? Easy. Head to the Layers panel, find the header symbol, and select Disable from this page to remove it just for that one. You can always enable it again later. 
And if you ever choose unset as header from here, it'll remove the header from all pages in your project and also remove the symbol from the layers. In that case, to get it back, you'll need to go back to the symbols library to assign it again. Simple, flexible, and super handy. So that's a wrap for today's session on symbols. Don't forget to drop a comment on how you've been exploring symbols in Droip. Until next time, goodbye.